Many times I made fun of him. I made fun of his religion. I made fun of his God. I did everything I could to start a fight with him, get him to argue with me. But he wouldn't argue with me. I would bring alcohol to him and show it to him. But he wouldn't touch it. Stay good day. Welcome, my friends, to The Storyteller, where you'll find First Nations people from across Native North America who are following Jesus Christ without reservation. Today we'll hear more from Jeannie Dennis, an Omaha native from Arizona. If you or someone you love is in bondage to alcohol, you won't want to miss this program. Harlan continued to drink and continued to run around. I continued to drink. And I think all this time I was feeling like the martyr. I was the poor one. I was the one that was being put upon. Poor me. And as our, our drinking continued, it got to a point where I finally, even even being an alcoholic, I realized that I, I didn't want to put up with Harlan anymore. The many paychecks that he blew drinking and go out with other women, buy his friends drinks, and there would be no more money left. We were arguing all the time, and I just finally filed for a divorce from him in the tribal court. I don't think he thought I was going to divorce him, but I did go through with it. And I decided, well, that's the end of that. You know, I don't want any more to do with him. I won't see him anymore. But I remember the last time I thought, well, this will be the last time I see him when he, somebody came to our house. They were going to give him a ride back to his Hopi reservation in northern Arizona. And they were, he took all of his clothes. I thought, well, that's the end of it. You know, I can go on with my life. And this was Friday night, and <laughs> I always remember this. It was about 8.30 on a Sunday night. Somebody knocked at the back door, and I opened the door, and here was Harlan standing there again. He had been drinking, and he, he was crying, and he said nobody wanted him out at his home. His mother didn't want him. His brothers and sisters didn't want him there. So somehow he found his way back to our home, and ended up on the back steps with all his luggage again. So. so I opened the door and I let him come back in. And when I told him we were divorced, you know, and we would have to live apart. So that went on for several months. We lived that way. And Harlan kept asking me to get married again, to remarry him. And I kept telling him no, that I didn't want to go through that again. And he would say, well, what if I change my life? What if I go to church? What if I change? And I didn't believe him because Arlen had always been very good at lying to me. And I always believed him and took him back. And then it would be the same old thing again. So I just told him I didn't want to get married again. But I, I don't remember exactly what came about that brought us to go to church one Sunday, but I think Harlan asked me, he said, let's go to church. And even though he asked me that, I know the night before he had been drinking and he was probably still hungover. But we went to church. It was one of the tribal churches. I'm sitting there in the congregation and I saw my husband get up and go up to the front and I saw him get to his knees, and I saw him cry. And even though I saw all of that, in my mind I kept telling myself, oh, he's just lying. He's trying to pull one on me again, and oh, it's so what, you know, he doesn't mean it up there. And I know he came back and he sat down, he didn't say a word to me. And when we went back home, later he told me what he had done. And he said, I promised the Lord never to drink again. And to me, that was another big lie because I knew, you know, he said that many times before. And he always went back to the alcohol. But as the days went on past that, I noticed that he wasn't drinking. He got a Bible and he started reading his Bible. 
I would see him pray. I would see him change over from his country western music to gospel music. He started listening to that. And I just kept waiting for him to fall. I kept waiting for him to give it up or give himself away that he was been lying to me again. But it just, he just continued to do what he was doing. He'd turn his friends away when they would come and ask him to go, go with them. And he would tell them that he couldn't do that anymore. And I, I just kept watching him, waiting him for him to fall, waiting for him to show himself the liar that he usually was. I, I didn't see him fall. He just kept reading his Bible. He kept praying and then he started going to church again and and I know most of my marriage to him, all I ever wanted for him to do was to stop drinking. But when he finally stopped drinking, and this is what I believe, I believe that the enemy really tried to use me to make my husband fall. My drinking increased. I Many times I made fun of him. I made fun of his religion. I made fun of his God. I did everything I could to start a fight with him, get him to argue with me. But he wouldn't argue with me. And I think one of the things that bothered me the most was that I no longer had control over him. When he was drinking, I had control. I was the one in charge. I was the one that took care of things. I would bring alcohol to him and show it to him. But he wouldn't touch it. And one day he came home from the church he was going to, and he said, I've asked the people to pray for you. And I remember getting so angry at him and telling them, how dare you ask those people to pray for me? They're all white people. But apparently they kept praying for me and praying for me, and I think I was one that I was trying to run the other way from the Lord. I didn't want anything to do with this Lord. As we got closer to 1996, my drinking got worse. And I, I even quit being a wife to my husband. We lived in separate bedrooms. He went his way, I went mine. And it was during this time that, that I really, really drank a lot. I could drink one big big bottle of expensive wine in one evening. I would sit there and finish the whole bottle until I was ready to pass out. And during this time, I wasn't paying attention to my husband. I wasn't being a very good wife to him. And I know, again, that Satan uses these things. that go Things that go on in our marriage, he'll use them against us and during this time, he brought in another woman into our life, into my husband's life. She didn't drink. I know she made my husband believe that she was supportive of him, and she read the Bible with him. And I think after a while, it just went a little too far. And this can happen in marriages when one. One spouse is not there to love and support the other. But my husband, when I found out about it and I approached him with it, he made the choice to go ahead and leave me and he was going to go with this other woman. He was going to said he was going to divorce me and leave me because I wouldn't quit drinking and he didn't care about me anymore. I remember the the day that my husband left me. It was March 13th, 1996. He walked out the door and took what clothes he had and he said he would be back for the rest. And as I sat in my living room, I remember thinking, well, this is, I need another drink. This is how I always handled things that got too bad or that threatened me. I always went for that bottle because that bottle seemed to be able to take care of things for a while. 
It would deaden the pain. It would make me forget these things. And I had that bottle of wine open on the table. I was ready to start in on it again. It was, I was sitting there looking at the bottle. All of a sudden I heard and I do believe it was the voice of the Lord talking to me. I heard him say, Janie, look what you're losing. And I was at that time I realized that I wanted my marriage. I didn't want my husband to leave me. The only thing I could do, think to do, because I didn't know where my husband had gone, I, the only thing I could do, I called his pastor in a town where the church was. It was about 30 miles from us. I called him and asked if I could talk to him. And he told me to come in, and I drove into town 30 miles, and I went to his office. I remember walking in there, and all he asked me was, what was it that I wanted? And I told him about the situation with our marriage, and I know that now that he already knew about it. He already knew about my husband. He knew about me. But when I shared this story with him, I just had so much hurt in me and I didn't know what to do with it. And it wasn't just from this incident with my husband and another woman. It was just years and years and years of hurt that built up. It just got too much for me. Too much for me. Just got, it just got so heavy. That's when the pastor shared the plan of salvation and how I could accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And how Jesus loved me. Well, we've run out of time today, but you can be sure that this story ends a whole lot better than it began because both Jeannie and her husband humbled themselves before God the Father and put their trust in the only one who could save them, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you put your trust in Him? He died, was buried, and rose from the grave so that your sins could be forgiven, so that you could be saved from the judgment to come. God tells us in His Word, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. If you would like a copy of today's program, ask for it when you write to us at The Storyteller, P.O. Box 1001, Bemidji, Minnesota, 56619. That's The Storyteller, P.O. Box 1001, Bemidji, Minnesota, 56619. Our phone number is 877-766-4648. That's 877-766-4648. You can also listen to The Storyteller online at withoutreservation.com. Thanks for listening. And remember, the greatest story took place at the cross, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's more to Jeannie's story, so be sure to join us again next time as we listen to The Storyteller.